Um, I'm thinking particularly of all the work they did for the International Opera Poetry Festival, bringing the best poets from all over the world to a quiet corner of England um, in this rural county called Suffolk. Um, the pair of them also did the best introductions too, so uh, I'm, I'm sure I'll, 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 I'll try and, I'll try and match, match up to them. Um, so I'm introducing Naomi, I'll stick to her. Um, she is a daughter of professional musicians. Her father was Max Jasper, um, a renowned popular violinist. Her mother was a famed contralto singer. She gave her life to the Orba Poetry Festival in 22 years, latterly as director of the Poetry Trust. Uh, and it was not only a festival, we had a first collection prize, seminars, poet in residence, poetry paper, podcasts. I've forgotten a lot of the things that we did actually. Um, those, were, those were the ones we, we, we did a lot. Um, and she's now a co-founder of Poetry People, which devises uh, heritage and cultural projects, bringing poetry to people often for the first time. Um, she gives 199% to everything she does, but she's also managed to keep writing over the years and written two rather marvellous chapbooks. I know she'd like to have written more, but um, these are really honed, heartfelt poems, uh, straight talking, sometimes hard hitting, always life affirming. Uh, so the two pamphlets are The Last Hour of Sleep, published in 2004, Driver in 2017. So. Uh, Please, uh, I want to say please welcome, round of applause for <laughs> Naomi Jaffa. Oh, Dean, thank you. That's so kind. Um, yeah, well, we're sort of a triumvirate, Michael, Dean and myself. And um, yeah, I wouldn't be reading any of these poems. I wouldn't have written any of these poems if it wasn't for Michael. Um, I'm going to read six and I'm going to start with one called Deal. And I have this really extremely unhealthy, psychologically unhealthy habit of investing very small things with kind of gigantic significance. Um, and here's a typical example of um, how I kind of think about my future. Um, I um, left a long relationship to move to a new town on my own. And this is deal. I make a deal with myself after the first night a way of testing the water, morning tea in bed, the new duvet, early sun turned to rain, clattering the rooftop opposite, the gray slates awash and darkening like the opening of a French film. I resolve to be happy or sad in this house, this new life, according to whether my crumpled list of house move instructions lands in the unfamiliar waste paper basket in the corner of this bigger bedroom. A miss and all here will be hopeless. Why then do I feel this quick quiver of disappointment when I throw the perfect shot, O oh monster of my self-pitying heart? Thank you. This is the weirdest thing. So weird not being in the room, breathing with people, breathing with you. I like breathing together. Um, this is um, from my first um, publication. It's a very old poem, but I have a kind of, it reminds me of what I was like in my 20s, basically, which is a long time ago. And I made some pretty lousy choices, um, but I lived. Don't take this personally, but I might persuade myself that I definitely still fancy you rotten if only you'd have a good wash. Perhaps slosh a dash of Givenchy, install a power shower even. Then maybe we'd stand an outside chance of staying together longer than an instant coffee in the morning, which is already looking much too far ahead. Basically, I'd really like it if you were gone, now, out of my bed, back to wherever it was you said you lived. Was it Highgate? And I'd be very grateful if you never showed up at work on Monday as the office equipment salesman, who still looks just like that actor, who I lusted after for the whole of last week because of an Irish accent and a name like Gabriel. 
He looked like Gabriel Byrne. He really did. Anyway, um, I am. Um, my first um, collection of poems was really a lot about my father, um, who died in 1991, and who I didn't have an easy relationship with, but. I knew he was extraordinary at what he did. And there have been so many times since his death, particularly in the last decade, I guess, that I would just love to have a long conversation with him and express my admiration for him, really. Um, in fact, behind me on the wall, there's a picture of him with his trio. Um, uh, and um, yeah, I love that picture. Um, I think this poem doesn't really need a lot of explanation, except I think we've all had this experience with people who've died, who come back to us. The Visitor. As far as I know, he never even liked it here, but quite suddenly, after staying away almost nine years, my father is back to visit me in Kerala, South India. In the middle of the night, as you'd expect, but also during the afternoons around tea time, riding the same air horn blasting hot and dusty trains. And he seems to like to call, especially before breakfast, during that last hour of sleep in hotel bedrooms. He looks about 60, but to be truthful, to date him accurately, I'd have to compare him with the photos. Definitely, he's much happier. Just the other morning he arrived, shorter than me as usual, and swept me off my feet, lifted me right off the ground and hugged me for no reason. Put me down, I'm much too heavy. Put me down, you'll break. But he didn't, and he doesn't, and my toes never touched our old gold top floor landing carpet. He fills out his trousers again, and his cheeks are back to normal, fat, tanned, glistening, and clean-shaven. I kiss him and kiss him, inhale that mix of Gillette foam and Floris's rose geranium. And all the time, he dizzies me with smiles. Um, uh, this is a more recent unpublished poem and I don't know whether I'm an optimist or a pessimist. Um, probably my two sisters who are watching here would say definitely a pessimist um, and my glass is always half empty but I'm not sure. I think I like to ensure myself against things going wrong by imagining that they always will because then I'm kind of safe when they do because I'm not taken unawares but deep down I kind of think things are okay. Anyway, um, this is a, that's a very tangential introduction to a poem which is just called the 20th of June. And of course, it's the day before Midsummer's Day, the longest day. 20th of June. Some days, all the ducks line up. It doesn't even rain. Cloudless, silver linings only. Summer is announced by countless flocks of swallows. House martins return to the gable end. The sea is so full of fish, you're dazzled for choice. You remain on the right side of the longest day. More, always more before you than behind. Lads and lasses still golden, no dust. Okay. Two, two more poems. I, 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 th I think that's okay, Don, for time. I, I have, as someone who sat through a hell of a lot of poetry readings at 22 years worth of the Albury Poetry Festival, you get sensitive to people who run on. No never, in a, never in a good way. Okay, so um, uh, I have a horse. Um, anyone who's a friend of mine here knows I have a horse, knows that she's the love of my life. Um, anyway, the four-legged love of my life. And um, she is kind of my best therapist because I'm very bad at yoga and meditation, I try, and I'm forever ricocheting between the past and the future. But having a horse 
you have to be with them in the moment. So this is mindfulness practice. And this is for my friend Tanya Kindersley, who has the most amazing blog about her red mare. And um, yeah, mindfulness practice. When the incessant fizz of past and future refuses to shut the fuck up, I seek out my flea-bitten grey mare and her rigorous attention only to this moment, then this one. I dump my claptrap on the muck heap along with a barrow load of her fresh shit and set to work. In the stable, I ask her to move over run my left hand down each fore and hind leg lightly to grasp below the fetlock, lift and hold each foot in turn, use hoof pick to dig out the packed in dirt, always heel to toe, careful to avoid the central sensitive triangle of the frog. I clean her coat from pole to rump in firm, even sweeping strokes of the body brush with curry comb punctuation, hissing quietly through my teeth, the way those old fashioned grooms were said to do to keep from swallowing dust and grease. She stands still throughout, even for her tummy, which so many horses find intolerably ticklish. I detangle and brush out her nearly white tail, and we finish with her head, eyes half closed ears drooped, great long face lowered to the rub of the bulb of my hand against the bone of her cheek, right where it itches most. And that's Miller, who is just, there's some pictures of her with my mother, which um, there's one in particular where her head is kind of lowered and my mother's head is lowered and they're just she's so tender and she just loves having her face rubbed and um this is the last poem um there are horses in it um i have written a lot of poems about my mother um in the the latter pamphlet that i, I that michael is my publisher the garlic press and i don't know i, I they're, they're difficult poems, some of them, and I just feel at the moment I'd rather err on the side of, of kind of lightness than, than heaviness. Um, but then I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy about this poem, but it's about death and dying, so I don't know, whatever. <laughs> this is not burial. Not flesh in a hole in the soil. Not vultures visiting a mountain tower not the parting of velveteen curtains to piped music. No cutting up and cutting out to give parts to others. Not naked, not clothed, maybe a white sheet, cotton, Egyptian. Neither sunshine nor rain, not quite daylight or darkness, dawn or dusk, please, when you don't yet know what it is you are seeing. Not silence, Definitely not singing, nothing composed. A blackbird riffing would be more than fine. And just a field, thickly hedged with a wide tree for shade in summer, its pair of greys released, heads up, watching the figure knot their ropes on the gate, walk away, turn the corner, leaving them to a whole and temperate day of mud rolling and good grass. Thank you so much.